Okay, well, Prynham da, a chroeso canis iawn i goleg y bydydwyr ca dydd a darlith Edwin Stephen Griffiths Dwy Bielach Egan. Very, very warm welcome to you all this afternoon. It's lovely to have you in the virtual South Wales Baptist College for our 2020 Edwin Stephen Griffiths Lecture. If you don't know me, I'm Rosa Hunt. I'm one of the co-principals of the college. And um, we're very, very happy this afternoon to have the Reverend Dr. Robert Beamish with us as well. Rob is the minister of Prince's Drive Baptist Church in Colwyn Bay. He's also a hub tutor in the Light College and Northern Baptist College. And uh, he's a friend of the college, a very good friend of the college. He's uh, visited several times before. Most recently, he came to do one of our preaching sessions. And so he preached what I think could fairly be called a kamikaze discourse, to use his own uh, quotation. And it was very much enjoyed, particularly because he left us with some intriguing culinary delights at the end of the sermon. It's just great to have you with us here, Rob. I really enjoyed watching your video and we're very much looking forward to what you bring to us. So it's the Edwin Stephen Griffiths lecture and who was Edwin Stephen Griffiths? Well, just you may have heard this 20 times before, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He was born in uh, Monmouthshire on August the 26th, 1869. He was the son of William and Rachel Davis Griffiths. And he, after primary school, he went to work in the coal mines till he was 18. And during his boyhood days, he was a very, very keen member of his local chapel, so much so that he applied to South Wales Baptist College to train for ministry, but famously, we turned him down. And so in 1886, um, when he was still in fact 17, he went to America and he lived with his uncle in Scranton in Pennsylvania and then to Cleveland where he met a lot of other Welsh people, became very popular, played a lot of music and became very, very rich. And when he died, he very kindly left um, a large sum of money to the Welsh Nationalised Steadbod and also a large sum of money to South Wales Baptist College for which we remain grateful. And so every year we have a memorial lecture, and this year, as I said, we're so happy to have Rob Beamish with us, and all of you as well, of course. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to lead you through a quick outline of how the session's going to go. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for the generosity of Edwin Stephen Griffiths, which has meant that the college could carry on over the years training women and men for mission and for ministry. We just thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for the opportunity to gather this afternoon. We thank you for the chance to reflect on this really important topic of how we continue to preach faithfully in a time of great disruption. We thank you for Rob and the way that you have gifted him. And we pray for him now that you'd um, help him to speak words which are not only intellectually challenging, but also nourishing to us as followers of Jesus. We pray that you would bless our time together, bless our discussions. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so just a very quick overview of what's going to be happening. Once I've finished talking, Ed, who's the other co-principal, is going to interview Rob for about 10 minutes. And during that time, we'd really like to encourage you to put any questions you might like to ask Rob in the chat. Now, we can't promise that we're going to answer all of these questions, um, but during the course of this hour, Rob will have an opportunity to pick out some of those questions and we'll answer them later on. Um, once Ed has finished interviewing Rob, then you will be put into breakout rooms and you'll be given um, some questions to discuss in the breakout rooms. And we'd encourage you to nominate someone from your breakout room who'll be able to, when you come back into the main session, give us two items of feedback from your group. And then there will be a time of um, open questioning when those questions which you've submitted through the chat, some of those will be answered by Rob. The meeting is being recorded and you should have been warned about that as you came in. If for any reason you don't want your face to appear on the meeting, that can be done. So if you could just contact us after this and uh, Ed will do his technological magic and put a black square over the place where your face is so nobody will ever know that you've been at the meeting. 
I think that's about it. So I'm going to hand over to Ed now. Thanks, Ed. Thank you very much, Rosa and Prinham and everybody. Good afternoon. It's a, a real pleasure to see so many people. Uh, and thank you for coming at short notice. And a particular thanks to Rob, who is here at short notice and has put together this, uh, this work for us in really short order. And we're most grateful to you, Rob. Um, if you're not quite sure where the chat is, then at the bottom of the screen, uh, you've got a, a, at least at least if you're on a computer, you'll have at the bottom of the screen uh, a little button marked chat. If you click on that, then it should open uh, another sort of window or box where you could type in your questions. And uh, when we have the feedback from the, um, the, the small groups in a few minutes, you'll type your feedback in there as well. But Rob, um, I really enjoyed watching the video. I was uh, disappointed that there weren't any outtakes, um, but I, I did find it really helpful the way in which you had uh, laid out the landscape uh, on which to place different examples of preaching during this time of COVID. Uh, and as I watched the video, I think I heard you asking three big questions. And uh, maybe this is a summary of what you said for those who haven't yet had chance to look at it. I think you were questioning the understanding of preaching. I think you were questioning our understanding of God and particularly the, the God that we preach in a time like this. And then maybe also questioning the difference that it makes to take preaching from uh, the place of the pulpit and the pew um, to the context of the computer and the virtually connected congregation. So if I were going to put that into a three-point sermon, I think I might say you were addressing the method, the message, and the medium. Oh, that's great. Um, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. So I, I want to just, in this few minutes that you and I have got now, yeah. just to pick up um, those three areas, really. And I guess to start, first of all, with, with the nature of preaching, because you said that what we need to do is to get away from self-help preaching and move towards what you called a, a, ther a theocentric therapeutic model of preaching. Um, can you tell us what those two approaches are and have you seen any examples of them in your study? Absolutely. And just to say, it's a great privilege to be part of this. And it was great to do the video. And I really worried about how to produce that. And it's had the most uh, views I've ever had for a video. Normally I get about 10. And the same for kind of sermon listens. So it was great to have quite so many. So I do appreciate that. Um, yes, I mean, we are in a culture that is therapeutic and there's nothing bad with that. But there was an author called Frank Friendy that said that actually, if we understand therapy as our main language, what happens is we can see ourselves as, as victims and we can see ourselves as those that always constantly need help. And there is something about modern preaching that can find itself getting trapped within self-help methodologies. And there was a guy called um, Harry Fosdick, who you may have heard about, great name, 1928, um, wrote an article called What's the Matter with Preaching? And he said, only the preacher proceeds still upon the idea that folk come to church desperately anxious to discover what happened to the Jebusites, which is a great quote. And his whole thing was leading towards what he called the project method or what became called the counselling method, where he saw he saw preaching as really counselling on a group scale where it was about addressing people's issues and whilst I absolutely agree with that that preaching has to be relevant I'm sure we all would agree with that and perhaps we find it hard when someone says preaching should or shouldn't be this or that preaching has to mean something but it needs to be theocentric um, basically that it needs to mention God because <laughs> the problem with kind of a lot of self-help stuff is you can take got out of it and put whatever figure you want you know i read lots of sermons you know prior to this particular study and actually you can take god out of it and put whatever you want it's a bit like the the higher power within certain kind of 12-step programs that doesn't really matter what the higher power is as long as there is one and so theocentric preaching neil uh, pembroke uh, basically argued that it points to the the divine therapy which i think is brilliant which is basically god's healing love expressed through compassion acceptance help and forgiveness but also through confrontation and challenge so it's about god who is full of compassion but also challenges us to be more than who we are so actually theocentrically therapeutic preaching doesn't simply say look here's comfort for you 
here's hope. But actually, it's a challenge to what that hope means for us, what it means for that hope to be lived. Now, you might think, what does that look like? You mentioned about an example, because um, I could go on, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. But there was a sermon that someone wrote on Acts 3 from the 22nd of March, so right at the start of lockdown um, in England. And they just very simply, it was about, obviously, um, the healing of the lame man and they wrote this they said peter gave the only thing that he had that was of any worth that could help the lame man it was jesus jesus was enough so right from the start of the sermon um actually there's the promise of comfort but the promise of comfort starts with something about the divine therapy or about god and i think it's just a challenge that where do we start our sermons where does that preaching begin i'm trying to stop no that's that's great please do um no um, <laughs> thanks ed because you call us i mean you're calling us back to um preaching about god uh, this theocentric idea but yeah. um to think about the kind of god that we're preaching about at this sort of time and uh, in particular in the video you said that there is a difference between a kind of theodicy on paper yeah. And the Odyssey in preaching, um, uh, pastoral preaching. And I just wonder what kind of examples of this have you seen in, in the research that you've done and, and what would be a good example of yeah. uh, what you're calling us to? And to put that in context, that's the not to keep talking, but that's the, the work of John Swinton in particular with a book called Raging with Compassion, where he makes the really clear point that we can have great uh, kind of great reasons why certain things have happened, but actually when, when the push comes to shove the suffering is still there and actually it doesn't matter you can't reason away the actual lived in suffering in that moment and this idea that's when eloquence ends he says and he sometimes he does say that sometimes our attempts for theodicy can actually become evil in themselves because they somehow deny the vulnerability and reality of the moment so it's something about a theodic preaching that actually allows us to experience uh, the pain of the moment and gives us integrity because we're so desperate to obviously give the hope that there is in Jesus um, and perhaps we all know this but it's a journey isn't it it's a journey through recognizing uh, that moment of pain and then moving to that that place of promise um, and and Swinton looks at Stanley Havas um, who says that in he said, oh, here's a quote he says from the early Christians suffering evil did not have to be explained rather what was required was the means to go on even if the evil could not be explained indeed it was crucial that such suffering or evil could not be explained that is that it was important not to provide a theoretical account of why such evil needed to be in order that certain good results occur since such an explanation would undercut the necessity of the community to be capable of absorbing the suffering and all that means <laughs> is about being a theodic community so um, I've seen that in some of the preaching that just isn't isn't ashamed to name the fact that we're going to have to get through this that it's not all okay and, and that sounds a lot of this you, you're sitting there at home going this is really obvious but it's just that permission to say we can stand up and say I don't like this and even I don't you know hesitate to say I don't like the online community in quite the way that we have to do it you know I, I, there's a loss there's grief um, and there was so there was a sermon let me find it um, and you can imagine you know Psalm 23 so there was a sermon from again in early on in March that just looked at grief and hope in Psalm 23 and just said actually we name the grief and the person said this you know I think we are all in the place that place of shared grief at this time as we reflect on the devastating loss of life across the world as a result of this particular coronavirus the statistics cannot be heard as news items without touching us at a deeper level and then they look at Psalm 42 why you are why are you cast down O my soul why are you in turmoil within me and then they start to point to the hope start to unpack this kind of journey so I think it's just that permission mm. uh, to name the grief and then point to hope but not not rush it and something by the sound of things of that not needing to explain all the time uh, yeah. to, to answer that why question and 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 Havas talks about the theodic community and my spell check tells me there's no such thing as a theodic community but it's about the community uh, that resists evil together so actually the nhs hand clap for all the the, the embarrassment i feel at the end of my road just kind of doing this actually is a community resisting evil to some extent or when the church worships on zoom or <laughs> live stream we are resisting something together um, and that's i think that's quite beautiful 
Yes, one of the things I, I wrote down, having watched your, your video, was uh, are we as a church a, preach, a preaching community? Is the church a preaching community that actually it's the whole community that preaches by our response? Um, Absolutely. I just want to one, ask one brief question about um, creativity because uh, you, you described Baptists very generously, I think, as um, having been courageous and adventurous, and it may be a long time, uh, if ever, since any of us heard that phrase used of Baptists. But um, just briefly, are there any very practical examples of creative adjustments that you have seen in the way in which people have taken preaching online? Um, and I think the really obvious question is, and I think you could all answer this, I'm sure, is that the sheer fact that we're here talking about this, the sheer fact that I've had numerous respondents who've come back to me by saying, we're doing this, we're doing that. It says that there has been creative adjustments. The fact that I'm not just standing there in my church on a Sunday morning and just preaching at the wall and hoping someone's going to hear me. And, you know, a big thing that people have done, I mean, it's all the obvious stuff, as I said in the video, you know, people are streaming and they're using video conferencing and there's Facebook reflections each day and there's people telephoning other people and there are mm -hmm. sermons you can dial into and all those things. And I just think it's good that Baptists, we, we actually, whilst it, I want to name the exhaustion of it, and, and there's this thing about digital natives, that millennials, this is their, this is the, their playground. And most of us are thinking, you know, <laughs> we, we, we've been we, we, we've been dragged into this uh, kicking and screaming um, and we're just having to do it because we have to and I think that's adventurous I said about you know, Tim Hutchins saying that um, you know the, the digital virtual church is about experimentation and I, it's just what's really brilliant is seeing people actually like myself and some of my initial efforts well I've got a very shiny head and I've got videos where all you can see is shine off my head and the fact that we're willing just to give it a go and the vulnerability of it so I think I see a group of people who and it's others are seeing it too are adventurous courageous and are vulnerable but are just doing that for the sake of the gospel um, and you know people are preaching shorter some people are preaching longer one great example is someone just emailed me the other day who's taking on kind of John McClure's round table idea and they or the old kind of Baptist idea of that they had a passage and they got four members of the congregation very different people to look at the passage before and then come into the sermon to give their own thoughts their own questions which zoom allowed them to do that in a way they may not have done on a Sunday I think that's a great I mean I'm gonna do that I might do that this next Sunday that sounds like a great example to me I'm really pleased that having a shiny bald head marks me out as courageous. That's great. Oh, it does. It does. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, thank you, Ed. We're now going to put you into breakout rooms and you're going to be supplied with uh, two questions to think about. Now, am I right thinking these questions are going to be broadcast into the breakout rooms? Um, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And, and there are two questions that kind of they come out of the video and come out of this reflection as well. So. Yeah. And so if you've watched Rob's video, you'll uh, have heard that at the end of it, he sort of highlights two questions. So the questions we're going to consider today are going to be based on those two questions. Um, yeah. So remember, please, that when we come back, we'd like you to give um, some feedback. So if you'd like to nominate somebody from your group to give two items of feedback in the chat. And also, if you haven't put, I see we have got uh, two questions for Rob already in the chat. If you'd like to put some questions to Rob, please feel free to do so in the main chat. Thank you. You'll need to accept, click accept when you are sent into your group. Right. I don't think everybody's, are we all back? Yeah, we might be. We've all moved around though. We have all moved around. Okay, so welcome back everybody, cross on all. I just say a quick word of apology to the Welsh speakers. I'm the Heriadai, that neither more driven is gonna technology or in the Padadver Camrieta. I'm doing Avo, a Tronas a beef group Yaith Gamraik, so sorry. <laughs> so welcome back everybody. Really nice to see you all. Um if you could post your feedback in the group chat, just two items we've suggested, but also if you've got any more questions for Rob, there is still time to post them in the group chat. So uh, please do do that. We have a couple of questions there already, and I'm gonna hand over to Craig now, who's gonna sort of come around with the virtual microphone as it were. Uh, 
at I least. I can see one or two questions uh, starting to appear. Um, so I'm going to go, uh, if I can find him, to Robbie. Uh, and there you are. Uh, Robbie, could you give us your, your question to Rob first, please? Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Bob, it's, um, you know, since January 2020, uh, I think I'm right in saying that about 308,000 people have died from coronavirus wor worldwide. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that statistic is going to be increased quite markedly when the truth of what's happening in Brazil comes out perhaps over the next month or so. But in that same time frame, 2.69 million people have died of starvation in our world. So I ask, you know, what is really unique about our present situation in dealing with coronavirus? Has it not just brought the stark reality of a fallen world and, and, and the perils of, you know, a, of a fragile life? A, a bit closer to home so that we're more aware of it yeah. and and actually what has, has really changed about the imperative to preach the gospel to people to give them that gospel of hope uh, beyond this this world that is so perilous for us um, you know people need to be able to stand back from their situation the situation of uh, of this world and, and and look up and see Jesus and have eternal hope that hasn't changed uh, and I, I don't really see that that our imperative to preach that gospel of hope has changed either. No absolutely and I think that's why you know one of the questions for the breakout groups was you know in the nature of the kind of how we connect the gospel with where people are at it's a I suppose a standard reflection upon you know evangelism within different and changing communities and you know, I agree wholeheartedly and actually you know if anything you know so much of the focus on lack of mobility or the lack of uh, our opportunity to not be socially distanced is really a is really a, a first world Western response. And obviously, the the, fact, the way to stop the virus was to wash your hands and to be socially distanced. In so many communities, that's they're the two things you can't do. Um, so actually, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I think hopefully in any of this, I'm not arguing that it's. I'm arguing more that actually we should take the imperative. I mean, as a church, we've been going through the Book of Jonah. And I have to say, the book of Jonah, it's what Tim Keller preached after 9-11 in New York. And, and I just think it really has this question of who is our neighbour? And actually the, the imperative there, knowing that God is a God of compassion, that every single person can come back to him for redemption. Um, and I think that shouldn't be lost. But obviously, you know, social crisis, as you point out, with starvation, if it's not happening on our doorstep, it's very difficult for us to empathise with. And it shouldn't be that way. And obviously what's been going on in terms of discussion about race and that sense of, you know, I can't breathe until you can. Actually, mm -hmm. the question of what, who is our neighbour or love our neighbour as we love ourselves, actually, it's just when other people's problems become our problems. And obviously the church has been at the forefront of that, but as preachers, it's just not letting that. And that's why I think my therapeutic stuff, I, I think the divine therapy are both challenges and comforts. And we mustn't forget that. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> it's kind of us. Thank you both. I can see uh, a little uh, cluster of questions emerging from uh, from Deb and from Mark Fairwater. Uh, I don't know um, whether you uh, we can uh, whether I think uh, Deb, you can probably see both of these. Uh, the one that Mark has said. Do you want to to uh, share that with us? I'm just looking for you, Deb. I can't find you. I'm here. Um, it was just our group's feedback that I was posting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've not had the group feedback, or we meant to... Yeah, what I was posting was our group's feedback. Yeah. Um, which was, first of all, that we, we didn't feel the, the content of the gospel, the message had changed. It was the context which had changed, um, and particularly of it being on our doorsteps, that we're used to kind of looking at crises from afar, from our settees, from a comfortable position, and perhaps in a community which is like distracted um whereas at the moment we've got kind of a sharper focus there's fewer distractions both for the people listening to the preaching but also for us as well it's perhaps giving us more of an urgency than we've had before yeah. um and also we felt that we were as preachers we were perhaps using less kind of christianese jargon because 
there's perhaps a wider audience and we don't know who's listening and we don't know where they are or what their background is so we're kind of really having to cut down on um the, that kind yeah. of jargon uh, absolutely yeah let me just say that's the thing that when i talked about um harry fosdick and the whole thing about the jebby sites and you know when when something's stripped back it forces us to say what really matters so it's back to rosa and the kamikaze discourse you know it's back to that sense of actually preaching preaching does matter i want to we want to want confidence again that if we proclaim the gospel we know that the gospel doesn't come about void but we kind of think that preaching we don't we wonder what it does to be honest sometimes and actually preaching has real power because god has power um mark fairweather tall and john davis you were giving feedback that was similar to that uh, I wonder, do you want to pick up on anything that either Deb or, or Bob has, Rob has said? Um, I could say something. I just ask it. It's a slightly, slightly different question, perhaps. But um, in terms of one of the things that was coming out of what we were sharing was that actually there's an advantage at the minute online in the flexibility that it offers. So one example was given of perhaps people who are doing shift work, key workers who can actually join in with. Um, churches at different times because stuff is recorded now so there's greater access to that um, the other side of it of what can happen is it offers people greater choice um, uh, and there can be something can there ever be a danger I guess is the question that I'm wondering of um, the digital revolution and lots of stuff online I can choose what I like so if I go to a service I can um, fast forward through the bits that I don't like on record <laughs> and I can just dip in where I want to rather than, um, you know, it's about making it what I like and what's convenient for me. Uh, and the words you often used about disruption, is there a danger that with all of this, the very disruption in our lives that God is supposed to bring is actually washed over into a consumerist view of worship? Absolutely. And I think, Mark, it's good to see you again. Long time. Um, yeah, and that's what, why my, my kind of long title, you know, disrupting, disrupting the d disruption by declaring the great disruptor, which was after trying to push the alliteration, was trying to say that there is all this disruption. And actually, there is this kind of narrative that says, you know, isn't this great that we are kind of pushing on with a digital revolution? But actually, this has been going on for a long time. And, you know, we, we just perhaps haven't been part of it. Or I've not chosen to be part of it and actually you know you're right the consumer mentality of things has always been there and uh you know and people will always kind of pick and choose and that, that's a huge danger and actually the, the 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 disruption is the fact that we often in either our worship or our gatherings or the books we read or the scripture we read we have to force ourselves to read or engage with stuff that we don't like or stuff that affects us or challenges us and it's it's that you know it's like, like obviously my bodybuilding that i do uh, which isn't very successful but i have to break down the muscle fibers um not working uh but so they have a chance to regrow but if we're if we're in an echo chamber uh, by that i mean if we're just in a chamber that tells us exactly what we want to hear then nothing's going to grow and i think that's a, you're right that's a real that's a real danger and and i think we're being very positive about the online experience i think we just need to be very aware um of that and the nature of yeah the flexibility is great especially for the disabled community and for those that haven't been able to access our churches and have said you know you know you've, you've taken you've taken taken long enough <laughs> to know that we're there uh, but actually no you're right uh, we have to be aware of um actually kind of what we're trying to say i don't know if that's oh. an answer. it's a statement not an answer <laughs> um thank you uh john davis was there anything else you wanted to add or ask from your group because that was on the same theme at that point yeah, yeah I, I think many of the same things that point but uh, I guess one of the things that we were asking as a group was, does a time of pandemic increase people's uh, sense of need for the gospel? Um, and in, in a time of perhaps uh, the other things that we might pin our hopes on uh, fail and fade quickly. Um, it did, and, and, and therefore, how does that affect the way that we, that we preach and that we present uh, the gospel does it in one sense we were perhaps asking in one sense make it easier to present it, it to an audience perhaps who are more uh, in tune with their with their perceived need for it 
And I think Deb, Deb had asked uh, even more bluntly, uh, are we now more aware of our own mortality and therefore more keen uh, of that? And, and do we need to attend to that more? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And a, a few of us who weren't in breakout groups, you and me, Greg, we were having a discussion about how we, you know, I, I use the term crisis, but obviously the argument is that crisis is quite short term and obviously this is quite long term. Um, but th there's, there's a real, I think, but crisis is helpful because it does force us to consider that, you know, that people talk about the new normal and everything changing, that actually there is something I would think about crisis preaching that has to acknowledge the reality of people's situations. Uh, and that's and things have been stripped back for people and we all know that um and that's why you know obviously when easter came you know jesus is in a sense self-limiting or limited himself on the cross and actually you know we were limited too so there was, that, there was that real reflection um there with actually what was going on at easter for us so it was kind of you know great timing in that sense um, there we go there's there's another sort of cluster of questions appearing i'm, I'm trying to kind of edit this on the hoof um but Graham Watts, you were asking about how do we uh, how do we pastor mm. groups of people who are not online? And uh, Mark and Steve, you were asking how do we pastor and, and connect with people who are not in the church? What what are their needs? Mark, uh, Steve, Graham, do you want to comment on any of those? Yeah. Uh, Graham, do you want to go first, and then maybe uh, Mark and Steve come in after that? Yeah, it's just a comment from the two people who are in the group who are currently in pastoral ministry that um, they have a number of um, elderly members of our congregations who simply don't engage online. Um, someone was saying that um, when there's a YouTube service being streamed off Facebook Live, um, they're having to sort of ring people up and play it to them down the phone um, as, as a way of just simply trying to communicate. But at the same time, those same people are picking up um, reaction from people in the States. Someone mentioned contact in Sweden. Um, and then also members of, of, of families who are not regular churchgoers, um, who are actually tuning in um, you know, to, to the way in which it's being done now. So there's this mix of opportunity and challenge. I think it was more a sort of, um, yes it's exciting but it's also extremely demanding and, and how, how do we best respond to that yeah and i think that's i mentioned in the video about you know heidi campbell who writes a lot on digital religion she said with there's so much discussion about platforms and how we do things but actually it's the question of what you know actually what does the church what does the world need the church to be at the moment and then how do we use technology to allow us to do that because yeah the the, the, the discussion about how great online church is, is being led by the people who are doing online church. And that's always been the way for the last 30 years with virtual church. It's just that more of us are joining in <laughs> with it. Um, and, and actually, yeah, and people get very excited when someone from Sweden or whatever comes in. But I think, I think that's a red herring. I'm trying to be controversial, but people go, oh, people are contacting. But actually, that's back to Mark's point about consumer culture. And people will always do that and that's not bad it's just that i'm interested in the people that live on the street behind the church um and uh and actually if i've got thousands of views from everywhere else that's lovely as part of global communion but it doesn't help me locally in mission um but you're right uh, and i so i'm i'm as worried about the people that i haven't seen for 10 weeks um as much as who we're connecting with um uh kim you had an interesting uh question uh in from from the group i wonder if you could share that with us can't find kim yeah kim could you could you share with us just um your your question about are we basically fed up about hearing of covid19 yeah, someone in the group, someone in the group was saying that um, an experience from the London bombings where a co-worker, one, one of them thought we should really um, discuss the issue on the Sunday after the bombings and the other one says, no, no, people want to come here to be um, protected from that and not have to face it. And the idea that some people come to church to escape um, the crisis. Um, I just thought it was a real interesting kind of 
dilemma on whether other people felt that the people are starting to, you know, like how you just keep switching the channels on the television. You just don't want to see it anymore. And how we've kind of, um, at least I know here in our family, we've gone from looking at the numbers every single day to like, we just don't want to hear the numbers anymore. <laughs> um, so it's a kind of, you know, how does that apply to our, our hunger um, to, you know, hear about it at church again. Yeah. Sure. And I think Kim could see, I think that whole thing over, over kind of crisis and social crisis that, you know, I think we you know, the initial response, especially around Easter was like, Oh my goodness, what's happened. And now actually it's about finding ways to be church and to do mission that sustain, not just being normal, but just finds a reality for where we are. And actually there's a great quote from Karl Barth that people might expect this, but he, he says this, in 1914, when the outbreak of war left the whole world breathless, I felt obliged to let this war rage on in all my sermons until finally a woman came up to me and begged me for once to talk about something else and not constantly about the terrible conflict. She was right. I disgracefully forgotten the importance of submission to the text. Um, and it's, it may come to the point that a member of the congregation must call the pastor to order and counsel reconsideration. <laughs> but I think the sense of, that's why when I did this Baptist study, I was trying to kind of say, what are we saying about the crisis? What are we saying about God? But again, it's the theocentric preaching that says, okay, let's start with God and try and frame stuff. And it sounds so obvious, but as you said, we can bang on about what's going on or can't feel that we can engage with either the normal questions of church and the joy and faith. Um, it's finding a balance, isn't it? Trying to inform our preaching uh, with what's going on. Yeah. Um, well, oh, I just want to say, I think at the beginning too, there was this sense of this is going to be three weeks and we just kind of need yeah, to yeah. hold our breath and um, come through it. And now there's that sense of what do I come out of this with, with my integrity, <laughs> um, with some growth, with some and just what do we learn in the in the cave you know that's the yeah yeah, yeah. and that, that's a, a kind of theme i want to pick up and ask helen there if she could comment because your feedback from your group was about um this feeling of exile of being in the wilderness mm -hmm. um a that uh, we hope the wilderness isn't going to be 40 years that it might be over a bit quicker than that <laughs> um but 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 also this sense of the wilderness being the opposite of how most of our church uh, experiences, which is quite celebrated. I'm telling, asking your question for you. I'm going to shut up now and ask you to do your <laughs> question. Uh, yeah, we were, hi Rob. Um, we Hello. were just um, reflecting as a group on things that we'd heard. Um, and a couple of people, uh, I think someone had heard uh, Rowan Williams reflecting on wilderness and people saying, please let us go back. And, and the message coming, well, we're not going back. Uh, and coming out of that, we reflected on how actually a lot of our church people don't want to hear the the message that might be well we're not going back to exactly what it was before that you know this talk that there's been a lot of comment on the new normal um and that implies we know what normal is i guess um and the other comment made as a result of that was well perhaps that's the message people need um so it's just, I think thinking about what you were saying, Rob, about therapeutic preaching, uh, the, the temptation for us is to want to say what our people want to hear. We want to bring comfort. And there is a comfort that comes from scripture, but that perhaps some of these exilic and, and wilderness texts um, give us a resource to do that. Maybe you could reflect a bit more on that. Um, or the texts of return, you know, when the people came back, it, it wasn't just like it had been. There were still loads of wrestling that they had to do. Um, and so those are the things that yeah. we were talking about. Absolutely, Helen. Good to see you again. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I think, I mean, Ray Williams wrote a little book uh, about horror. It's about horror, terror and horror or something where he talks about the ability of tragedy to help us narrate our own existence. And, and that's why we need to watch King Lear and other kind of narratives and stories. We, we like the thrillers that try and give shape to our world, let us interpret things. Obviously the, 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 the tragedy does that. And I think, yeah, the tension here, so like with the therapeutic is, and it's the question of lament, isn't it? It's the question of allowing ourselves to lament. I think that's what I meant in terms of saying, 
you know, um, this kind of Lutheran law gospel and you kind of go down, you know, you can, um, Paul Scott Wilson talks about trouble and grace and I want to say kind of pain and promise, but just allowing ourselves to be in the pain and not to rush the promise. And, and that's, I suppose it's like for those of us take funerals, it's the same thing, you know, actually, you know, kind of for me, all my kind of study mm. on crisis stuff came out of going to a funeral where the vicar said, isn't this great? And I thought this isn't great. Um, it's real pain. So actually we found, I mean, the first thing we did was a series in Habakkuk. Um, you know, not everyone's kind of go to, but I think it's giving people a voice and saying, you know, it, it, it's okay. Now, now we're doing Jonah. So it's all fun, fun, fun. Um, oh, wait, you know, to come, to your church. <laughs> they come to the joy. It's all joy down here. Um, but I think it's that wrestling, isn't it? And, and only we know our people and our congregations and the concepts, but I think you're absolutely right. I just think I'm not kind of adding any wisdom to that, but I think it's allowing ourselves to be sad and wrestle. And I think, and it's being said, and Kim was saying to this, this narrative of the new normal, and it isn't everything going to be different? Well, actually, we've been through war before, and perhaps we haven't, but the country has, and things get back to some kind of shape. And we just need to be confident that, you know, God's on the throne. But actually, you know, I, I fear the new normal because I, I can only cope with a little bit. I can't cope with too much change. Um, I kind of want things to be like they were before. But obviously, some things will be different because I've now discovered Zoom. And um, I start to twitch every time it's mentioned, uh, but I think I can't go back, um, <laughs> which is a horrible thing. But yeah, we, we, we've got to embrace the difficult parts of scripture that allow us, that give us a song to sing, give us that voice in the midst of it. I think if I, Craig, if I'm allowed one more comment back, um, yeah. it seems to me that um, that scripture does actually give us permission to do that. Yeah. Um, because it's not us coming with our ideas. And so, and actually, if we are faithful to the text of scripture, um, and we allow scripture to speak itself rather than putting our own therapeutic sort of tendencies on it. And um, then it takes us slightly out of the, it's not just our personal agenda, maybe. Uh, and that yeah. frees us to speak into a community that might not want to hear that uh, unsettling word from scripture, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what Neil Pembroke says about um what therapeutic preaching can be is that the redemptive the redemptive narrative of god is lost as human solutions get shifted to center stage mm. and god's make god makes an appearance from time to time but god's role is little more than a cameo and it's that sense of try as you uh, uh, absolutely agree <laughs> you know it's how we let god be the center of that thanks adam um i've i've i wonder do two little clusters and i know we're running short on time um but um i want to to leave the last question to mark thomas to ask that that a question about about where mission is in all of this um but before that um andrew uh, kleisner and um someone else <laughs> had a question um about about how we preach I think maybe it was Roy Kersley had asked how we preach about a global situation in a local, a global pandemic in a local situation. But Andrew uh, Kleisner had a question, and Andrew, I, wish, I wonder if you can share that one just about the preacher's role in all of this. Yeah, surely. The question was obviously when we're preaching in a time when we recognise that our hearers are feeling pain, we empathise with them. Mm. But how, if you like, authentic can our preaching be if we're not actually participants in that pain, but if you like, people trying to empathise from outside? And I was thinking very much of, say, Al Sharpton last night when he was preaching at this memorial service to Floyd. You know, he really felt it, he was preaching because he's part of that community. He's, you know, he's not the outsider looking on. We could stand in that community and preach and be angry, but we're not part of it, we haven't experienced it. So, to what extent? can we preach authentically if we don't actually participate in that and to what extent does god participate in that pain and i know we have all these issues about god and his passive impassibility and things like that absolutely um yeah a lot a lot that could be said just in a minute or two uh, but i think i think and this is what we as preachers or christians face the whole time isn't it because i've um you know it is uh, les newbegin that talks about in terms of mission talks about lenses that we have you know and owning who we are and we can only be who we are and the joy of i would say the gospel and there's a great book by michael knowles on preaching that basically says you know, we are all crucified by christ we are new creations so actually the binaries slip away so we must try and resist the temptation to say you know i feel your pain because i kind of don't and i'm not the same but also in christ in that death 
and our resurrection, and especially as we preach, actually those binaries have gone uh, because we are all crucified. Now you might think that's just theoretical, but I think you know it's that it's it's that same point. You know, it's also about recognizing where others have a more authentic voice than us. So you know, I couldn't have done what Al Sharpton did yesterday, and I wouldn't have tried. Um, but I can speak up with my 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 own voice, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it's what we face all the time, isn't it? And it's how we as preachers allow other people in as well and other narratives and the illustrations we use and the people we, we read as well, the stories we watch, the films we watch to allow us to have something to say, but recognizing that it is God. Again, we point to God who um, actually we're crucified with him. I don't know if that helps. Well, oh, actually, and in terms of God, sorry, the whole sense of God's emotion. I mean, that's uh, what I did um, yeah, a whole kind of thesis about really in that sense of saying that I do believe that God is both transcendent and also absolutely passionate and with us. I don't think we have to choose. I don't think we have to choose uh, that God is engaged with us. And then we see that and that finds its limit in Christ, you know, who weeps at the tomb of Lazarus, who is with us in the midst of everything. Mm. That's a quick response. Thanks, Joe. It's all we have time for. <laughs> all right, as, as we move on through quick responses, um, but one last question um, from, from Mark Thomas, because I think this is one of the questions that um, will increasingly um, be our, 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 the source of our, our, our reflection and our questioning as the pandemic continues and as a, a new normal starts to emerge. Mark, could you share your question with us? Uh, hi there. Well, it's, it's a question that, uh, apologies, Bob, it's not necessarily directly uh, in response to your paper, <laughs> which was an excellent paper thank you but uh, it's just the way I'm feeling at the moment really which is in what sense do people think they're actually doing any mission at the moment yeah. I, I, I honestly you know total heart do not feel that I'm doing any mission even though my online presence is like you know 10,000% in comparison to what it was you know four months ago um, but the, just the inability to be with people to eyeball you know, individuals or groups, um, it's, it's, it's a broader question than Absolutely. really. So I didn't feel the need yeah. to ask it, but thanks. No. But I think it's a great, it's a great place to finish, isn't it? Because I can't answer that. I think it's an individual question. And, and I think, but I think we need to be honest and say, yeah, because the whole thing about, uh, there was a guy in the States who wrote a book about platforming. We should all find our platform online. And, and actually the world is crowded now with everyone trying to have a voice. And, and, and I really feared digital comparison at the start and, People say, I've just produced this video and there's this amazing digital video and it's, and I'm there just with my shiny head. And, <laughs> and I think we've got to say, yeah, that this is not, we, we've not lived through this. This is not normal. And whether, you know, it's just a Western response or, or anything, we've just got, this is where we have to be adventurous and courageous. We have to own up to it that it's not all great, but there are some opportunities, uh, but some of those opportunities feel a bit thin. Don't they? You know, people, someone liking my post on Facebook actually means nothing, really. Um, so I, I, I'm with you. I want to get back to some kind of normal, taking with me the really good stuff um, from this. And um, I want to try and eyeball people without them actually faking, going to the other side of the street and putting their mask on when they see me. Uh, but we've got to, I think we just need to pray and we've got to wrestle with this. But no, that's just a, I think that's for all of us to take away. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Craig. Thank you to everybody who's contributed. It's been a really fantastic discussion. I see the discussion still actually going on in the chat, but it is uh, coming up to half past four. Well, it is half past four, so uh, we're going to have to uh, bring it to a close there in the next minute or so. But, you know, you can continue to interact. Um, there, the college has a Facebook page. If you want to carry on discussion there, um, please do. It's really, really good to, to just keep talking. If you want to find out a little bit more about um, what Rob thinks about these matters, he's written a, an excellent Grove booklet called Preaching in Times of Crisis. You can also listen to him on Sunday morning. He's going to be on All Things Considered um, on BBC Radio Wales this coming Sunday. And we'd also like to invite you all to our valedictory service. This is going to be held again in the same format electronically over Zoom on the 4th of July at 7 p.m. We hope invitations for that will go out very soon. And Jenny Entrican, who many of you will know, will be preaching at that service. 
So thank you very much once again, Rob. We really appreciate you giving your time and your expertise and your energy. It's just been so good to hear. And, you know, I'm so impressed by the speed at which you found relevant quotes when people came up with a question. <laughs> I think that's amazing. So well done. Thank you very much indeed. Let's just end with a prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for the time we've had together this afternoon. We thank you for giving us minds and the, the ability to engage intellectually with things, to be able to talk things through and to think things through. But we also thank you that we have the privilege of engaging with things which matter, that we're quite literally talking about uh, matters of life and death and hope and despair. And so these are things that aren't just intellectual issues, but go right to the core of what it means to be human and to live good lives. And so we thank you for, again, for Rob and for his faith and for his experience and his gift. And I pray for all of us as we go from this place, that as we continue to wrestle with what it means to live faithfully as ministers and church leaders and Christians and churches in a time of disruption and crisis, that you would help us to be in tune with your spirit, to listen to what the spirit is saying to the churches and to be obedient. Amen. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of afternoon.